You're listening to this week's You Ask, We Answer session, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome to the very first session of You Ask, We Answer. And this is simply a podcast where you, the church, uh, the members of the OSL congregation are going to submit questions to us, and we just have a dialogue about it. Casual, relaxed dialogue, answering your question. Um, I'm pretty excited about this because I think this is a way that we can have this conversation with the congregation um, in, a, in a unique and, and neat way. So um, each week, or, or we'll, we'll figure out the frequency is based on the questions, but ideally each week, you'll submit questions and we will answer them. And so we have some questions already submitted, thankfully, from some of our uh, members of the congregation. So I'll let Pastor Radke read the first question. Great. So the first question is a question about Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And the question is, what does it mean to love the Lord? Right, so great question, uh, and this is a fun question too in my mind because a lot of questions when we read the scriptures come from what part of the verse are we going to focus on, mm-hmm. right? And so this question could have been another question too. Uh, it could have been, uh, what if that isn't the good, or, or who knows what good is, and that sort of thing. Uh, and without getting too vague there, I guess that that would maybe even be where I start with this before we get into the love part is uh, all things work together for the good. So I, w- I would say, right, all of us as believers and people in this world have some sense of what we think good is, mm-hmm. right? Many of us wouldn't say, oh, losing my job. Well, that was good, right? No one would call that and look at it as good good, but it very well may be good because of what God has coming next. Yeah. So I think the faulty thing is, is that we know what good is. As the fallen creatures with yeah. sinful natures, like, we don't define good. It doesn't start with us. God is good, and he promises goodness to us. So before I get into the the, the real submitted question is I, I just want to emphasize that thing is let's also not assume that we define good. Yeah. Cause we could look at that and say, good means I have a million dollars and I'm retired on a beach somewhere mm-hmm. and God's like, well, that's not necessarily my definition of good. Sure. And so then we could get that distorted view and then think God's not interested in my life. This is why I have hardship. God's forgotten me. Right. Like we could go to a biblical example right off the bat, right? Uh, Joseph being beaten by his brothers, thrown in a cistern, sold into slavery years later, right? Probably, I don't know, 30, 40 years later, we finally hear Joseph say to his brothers, what you meant for bad, God meant for good. And how often does God disguise the good he's doing in what appears to our eyes to be bad? Yeah. Christ on the cross. Yeah. One of God's greatest works. Well, that doesn't look good. I would I wouldn't have been an onlooker saying, ah, well, that's good, you know. Uh, but yet it was. And so and that that's may why, touch to God's timing. Right? right. Exactly. And that's why we need to kind of be humble ourselves and let's not presume that God has to answer to us and how we define good. Right. So okay, so let's right. move on to the question. What does it mean to love the Lord? Okay. Uh, the, the very first thing I thought on this was, why are you asking this? Mm, like, yeah, like yeah. what, what is it that drove you to this question? Like, are there, are you concerned about your eternal salvation based on something? Um, did you read something in scripture that made you nervous? Like what, sure. what, what drives, what is it? And we don't know, we're, we're speculating, yeah, right. but that's kind of something that sat in my mind when I first read this. No, that's real important because when we, I think it was just yesterday, I was thinking to myself, I had a professor named Dr. Kolb who, when you asked a, a class and a question in his class, he would always say something like, why do you want to know? You know, so he was trying to 
discern a little bit as to are you trying to answer this to prove somebody else wrong? Right. Are you a- right. asking this because you don't know? And you know, he was really trying to get at the heart of the intent behind the question. So, yeah. uh, but since we can't, we're not dialogue, and we don't know that. We can just go with what the question was. Sure. Is, what does it mean to love God? Well, uh, there's there's a passage in First uh, John chapter four. Verse 20, that says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he, ha- whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, that's not an answer to the whole question, but it does help us find a starting point, in my opinion, at least, is what does it mean to love God? Well, I could say to you, Mark, uh, what does it mean to love your bride and your children? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point. How do I put this into real things? And so when I think about my wife and, and children, um, if I love God, then I'm going to honor my wife. Mm-hmm. I'm going to respect her. I'm going to lift her up and put, herself, put, herself, put her before myself. Right. Um, and then my kids, I think to the, the scripture that talks about don't exhaust your kids. Like mm-hmm. Discipline your kids, but don't be so overbearing on them that you just beat them down constantly. Yeah, and I think you're totally onto it. Is what does it mean to love God? Well, uh, since it's God we're talking about, and not our wife or children, it means to to live in the way that He's called us to live. So it, it kind of gets us even, I would say, into the Ten Commandments, if you will. Uh, what does it look like to love God? Well, it means to have Him as number one in your heart and no other idols. Yeah. What does it mean to love God? To your point, is to sixth commandment is to, to love my wife in such a way that I honor her and respect her. What does it mean from a kid's uh, perspective to love God? Well, uh, evidence of me honoring my father and mother is evidence of my love for God, which is kind of what we're hearing here in Grandfather John as he writes this in his, his elder years. Is there's a connection between uh, loving God and and your action or obedience to how God says to live. Sure. Right? And so you can't say, while you're going around stealing from all these businesses, how you love God. Right? Yeah. Like that yeah. would just be a, like, well, like he says here in this passage is you'd be a liar. Right. Uh, because a love of God does not look like that. So that's what we can maybe also get into. Well, what does it look like to to love God? Well, I don't know if I see my neighbor getting up to go to church every Sunday while I don't, and I see that he's kind and does things for me, and I think, wow, you know, this guy seems to be different. You know, uh, he seems to love this God that he professes because he goes to church there, he volunteers and does stuff, he cares about me when I've never shown care for him, right? And you kind of realize I could come to a conclusion as an outsider like, man, if, if he told me he's loving God and that's why he does these things, I would really totally begin to understand what this love of God is. Yeah. You know? It's uh, in like the, going back to the parallel of, of a wife and kids. If, if you love your wife, like you can tell someone loves their spouse without him ever talking to them, mm-hmm. just by observing them, mm-hmm. just by watching like, like how they interact and like the husband holds the door for the wife or uh, uh, has his arm around or something. It's you don't even need words. Oftentimes with this stuff, it's just by observing. And so our actions, I think you're you're right on there. Where our actions towards the Lord, they're not necessarily salvation actions. We're not doing these to earn God's merit, right? But they are a way of witnessing to our love for God. Yeah, a way of expressing that love. And maybe another example would be something along the lines of. Uh, I think of more of a concrete example of all things work together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So uh, I might have been wrongly convicted of doing something that I didn't do or accused of something that I didn't do. And that's a scary place to be in when people are coming against you with accusations and you didn't do the thing that they said that you did. Uh, Well, I, I look at this as, look, if I did the right thing in this moment that they're talking about, whatever it is, uh, and I was honorable uh, to God and to my neighbor, then I've just got to trust him with the outcome of how this thing turns out. 
you know, and, and not knowing what that might look like, what it might mean for me. Maybe I'm going to have to suffer for, who knows, if it were a serious crime. You, you, there's people who have gone to jail for years, and then guess what? They were innocent, you know. Yeah. So that's where I would kind of say as long as you're, you know. It, now, if I'm going out and breaking car windows throughout the neighborhood, right, things aren't going to turn out well for me. Right. Why? Because I'm living contrary to God's way of life and his law for life. And so I wouldn't start quoting this passage and going, man, it said that all things work together for me because I love God, and why am I going to jail over breaking 17 windows? Well, well, because you broke 17 windows, you know? Right. Can God forgive you? Of course he can forgive you, but is there going to be a consequence? Yeah, there's going to be a consequence. You're sure. going to, whatever they're going to do in the courts for it or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if this is helpful in answering the person's question or not, but I think that it, you, you, you associate love is shown in action uh, and devotion. And Jesus says, right, that which comes out of your mouth comes first from your heart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a good thing. And, you know, like, in a, like you and your wife, if you tell your wife, hey, Robin, I love you, she knows that's coming from a good place in your heart, you know. But if you say something mean to Robin... It hurts because she knows that's also coming from your right. heart, right? And that's what Jesus right. is telling us about all of us. And so, so I would say, you know, loving God starts in our heart, and, and, and we pray moves its way out into our words, our actions, our thoughts, all the things that we mentioned in public confession in church, you know, forgive me for my thoughts, words, and actions, and those sorts of things. So, Yeah, because you think about it, if, if you, you say if you said to your wife, I love you, but then you just mistreated her all the time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's like, Really? Do you right. really love me? I mean, it's, it's, it seems a natural progression that, sure. that the love is manifested in actions and the love is manifested in words and yeah. in, in interactions. And, and, and there's got to be authenticity, right? Yeah. So I, I don't want somebody to read this passage and think, oh, if I'm not perfect in all my actions, words, and deeds, then God's not going to help me out. It's not going to turn out for my good. Well, no, that's not necessarily true either because he offers us repentance, confession, absolution, Lord's Supper. So uh, loving God, as we talk about commandments, isn't just about doing, but he also commands repentance when we've done wrong. And when you do that, you're doing the right thing. It's a way yeah, of I mean, that's love showing the love of God, right? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Saying, Lord, I'm sorry for, for breaking yeah. the command you gave me. So, so that's where I think what you were kind of hinting at that I, I totally agree with is uh, this love of God does not mean... Uh, there's this direct correlation between how well you obey and how well it works out for you. Right. Right. Uh, now, you may see a correlation in terms of how well you obey and the benefit to your relationships. Sure. Or the sure. happiness or the contentment or the joy, but it doesn't necessarily say, God doesn't necessarily say, all right, I got a bigger room now because you were good today. That's a good point. And maybe we ought to think about it that way too, is right. You, there's maybe more of a correlation or correlation in the horizontal realm. Mm -hmm but not necessarily the vertical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is uh, God's abandoned you because you made the wrong choice. Right. Or you hurt your neighbor or whatever. Right. Uh, and so, because, uh, right, and in a test case, right, look at Job, right? Uh, Job is singled out by God because he's upright, righteous, just, kind, compassionate, and then he goes through all this stuff, Right? All these losses, all these things that he's crying out, not knowing why, why they're going on, why they're happening, these sorts of things. And, and he was a faithful guy. So, But then it speaks to the text that you're going to preach on this Sunday from Isaiah of, um, fear not because I'm with you. I'm with you. Yes. So even though Job was going through a lot of terrible, terrible things, God hadn't abandoned him. And God sure. doesn't abandon us here, even though we've got to go through some hardships for whatever reason. Yeah, um, and that's the hard part, to your point, is, and that's the thing I hope I don't forget to mention in the sermon, too, is uh, he promises to be with us, but he doesn't promise what it'll look like while he's with us. Right. You know, and, and sometimes we want that. You know, you're only with me if you take the cancer away immediately. You're only with me if I don't get charged in the crime. Or we <laughs> sign off on God real fast when he doesn't take away a hardship. Right. And we say, well, he just must not be here. He yeah, must not love exactly. me. He must not care. But that's, we know from scriptures that's not the case. Sure, sure. So I think this goes back, just kind of close this one of, of uh, God works for the good. The good may come 
we have to wait a full lifetime to really realize the good. I mean, I know there's people sure. in this world that live uh, probably probably miserable <laughs> lives from start to finish. And so they could look at this text and go, there's no good in the God. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. And God said, well, hold on. Hold yeah, that's on. Maybe hold the, on to the faith. That's a great point because maybe the, the real tough thing here too is is maybe you won't actually understand what the good was for you yeah. until the new heaven and new earth. You know? Yeah. I mean – Sometimes you're maybe lucky enough to know it now and, and see it, or even in hindsight, you know, down years later, you see it here in this world. But it could also mean that you, you don't know the good as God has defined that good versus how you have till the till the new new, new heaven and new earth. Yeah, so. and we never know what God's like. You said earlier, we never know what God's working in that struggle. Right. Right. So that that may be God's way of helping redefine our understanding of good. Sure, and there's all kinds of things. So, uh, good question. Thank you to the individual that submitted that question. So our second question that we're going to talk about here, a little different topic. It says, says this, how do some people credit God's work in their life as only responsible for good things and never bad? Isn't it possible that the answer is both God and the devil or the world that can be responsible for both good and bad things? So this is basically saying, I, I feel like this is kind of leaning towards God and the devil partnering. The question being is: Is God partnering with the devil in bringing harm into our lives? Mm. Yeah, and this one's tricky too because with this question, we don't even necessarily know what this person means by good or bad. Uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I can't speculate for how they would define it, but I, I guess how I would maybe begin to think about this or or talk about this is um, the nature of God and who he is. He's never going to be the source of evil uh, or harm to us, right? But do bad things happen to us in this life that God could have in his omnipotency, his all-powerfulness, he could have made it not happen to us. Yeah, yeah, you know, that happens. But I think in this, this is a complex thing. While it sounds simple with just using the words good and bad, it's really not because you have to have this concept of a fallen world, things not going according to plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, Jesus and many of his miracles, right, healing the, the, the paralyzed or the blind or the deaf. What is Jesus doing in those miracles? He's reversing the effects of sin in that person's body, right? So, so that was a bad brought into the world by sin that they're deaf, mute, or paralyzed, uh, and he reversed it, right? So we, we do see him as the one who creates us anew. We see him as the one who's responsible for restoration and renewal. But in this life, we also have to know he didn't heal every blind man. Mm-hmm. He didn't heal every paralyzed person. And, and only those reasons are known only to God. And, but we do know this, as God has promised that all of those things are healed in the new heaven and the new earth. Right. Right. And so... So how would you... How would you and I would also say, back, sorry, I'm in a... Uh, I would never say that the devil is a partner with God. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the devil wants to help God in absolutely no way and wants to totally destroy you and any belief you've put in God in every possible way. Yeah. Right? So, And even the thought of, for me, the thought that, just the thought that God would partner with Satan mm-hmm. just feels like the greatest betrayal. Like, yeah. how? Why? And, and thankfully, I mean, I haven't read every word, but there's no evidence of that in Scripture. No. And, and here's what God can do is he can take the bad and the evil that you suffered from the devil and use it to his good, mm-hmm. right? And so I think some people would word that in, in other places as God can redeem evil. I mean, he can, he can make something good come of it, back to the Joseph story, right? Evil was done to Joseph, but God used that evil as, a, as kind of uh, something that would occur on his way to what he was going to do with Joseph for his entire life. Mm-hmm. of Israel during the famine. So uh, so yeah, the, the, the devil's 
the source of evil and, and the wickedness plus our own sinful natures. So let's take a incredibly relevant example for everyone today. Mm-hmm. COVID, the pandemic. Mm, yeah. Some might say, why did God put this on us? And based on scripture and what we've discussed here, it's not that God, God allowed it. Mm-hmm. Did you say that? Yeah. Yeah. But God didn't, it's not, it's not a, it didn't source itself at God. It sourced itself in the broken world. Sure. In the sinful world. God has allowed it to um, exist for reasons that God knows. Mm-hmm. And God is most certainly working in it and through it. It exists for reasons that God knows and China knows, right? No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if we could get into that one, no. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. I mean, this is a highly politicized thing, right? COVID and, uh, I think it's fair to say no matter which side of the spectrum you fall as it relates to COVID, as I, as I learned from you either today or earlier today was COVID's a big pain in the butt Mm -hmm. for everybody, you know, no matter where you fall on it, it's disrupted life. It's interrupted things. It's made us to change in areas where we didn't want to change and on and on and on we could go, uh, and, and not like COVID. Right. But to your point, COVID right, is another one of those things, not to be overly simplistic, but it's evidence of living in a broken world, Yeah. right? I mean, I know that sounds too simple. I know people just don't like to hear that. What's the, does, does all problems in the world have the same root? Sin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Sorry, but it's yes. It's like, well, I don't, I want to argue more about this. I want to talk more about I this. Want to blame it's like, someone. no, but I mean, if we're going to yeah. get somewhere, sure, there's layers above that that we can discern and go through and work through, but why things don't go the way God intended them to go in this world that we now live in is because of sin and the fall and the brokenness yeah. that took place and is still taking place and has not been promised to be fixed until this world comes to yeah. an end and a new heaven and a new earth are created. So... And what's so interesting about it, or I would say maybe maybe interesting is not a good word, maybe kind of frightening about it, is as much as God is working good through something like a pandemic, the devil's also doing his thing. Sure. And he's interacting in it. And I saw I saw so many examples over the past couple of years where um, we're all going through this beating, and yet you see people just treating each other horribly. Mm-hmm. And I look at that and go, man... Look what the devil's doing in that moment. Yeah. And we have a we have a choice in these hardships to decide which we're following. Sure. And it's a whole lot easier to follow. Uh, That's a good Satan, point. But it's whole much it's so much more effective to follow the spirit. I really like that because COVID, right? No one wants it, no matter where you sit on the spectrum of your opinion of COVID. Yeah, no one hate. wants it. It's right. a pain pain for everybody, the whole world. Well, so how do you look at it? Well, like you just said, well, I could look at it in such a way that it leads me to argue, be ticked off, get angry with people, and end relationships. Mm-hmm. Or I could say, wow, th- this is tragic, that, that sin has played its part in delivering such a horrible virus that's gone around the world and, and killed a, a number of people, a lot of people. Uh, wow, but guess what? We now have an opportunity that we didn't have before covid to show how God's love serves others. Mm -hmm. We can step into that gap that this brokenness has created as Christ would want us to. Right. Right. So new ways to care for people. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Hey, here's this big thing right in front of us that every church, every Christian can say, you know, I've never been good at helping others or doing, well, here it is. Right, it's an right opportunity here. that didn't previously exist yeah. now exists here, and that's evidence that look at the good, look at the uh, the way the Lord opened our eyes in this hardship to love other people Sure, that we wouldn't have seen in, in other times. And and to respect nurses, right. doctors, the whole medical right. people that are exhausted. And or even, hey, how about even the stretch of respect politicians trying to make the best decisions? Yeah. Trying right. to make good policy? Sure. That's a hard stretch, right? It is, for, it is for a lot of people, right? But uh, I mean, I really, you can, yeah, we probably just ought to not yeah. go there. But Let's not go down. I don't, I don't believe any politician <laughs> wants more Americans to die no, from COVID. hundred percent. You know, now right. you can get into whatever else you want to get into, but I don't right. care how much you hate somebody. I don't think that person hopes more Americans die. Right. 
You know? Right. And sometimes we just need to smack ourselves in the face and say, okay, quit being right. ridiculous. And, and some of the, some of the things to do in hardship is to look for the ways the Lord um, is moving. Like I remember the day uh, when this hit, what, what was it? 2020 when we didn't have Easter service, we did a remote service or something for Easter. Was it 2020? Maybe night. Um, Everything anyways. kind of hit the fan in March of 2019, right? Is that what it was? Okay. So then that, that Easter, yeah, whatever um, that Easter was, that Easter, okay. um, I remember we were remote uh, worship. And so our, our family did the worship and it was a beautiful day. So we were just stir crazy. And we went out in, in the street and there's uh, some neighbor kids, like five kids, I think live two houses down and there's no cars driving because everyone's at home. And so no one's driving their car. So our street, we have this long straight street was just wide open for hours. Nothing. Normally there's random cars. So we got the kickball out and we had like a three hour kickball game. Dads and moms <laughs> out there booting the ball that now probably wasn't good CDC, whatever. But we had a blast. That was our, still early enough to not be yeah. considered a, the devil because you were out there. Right. And our kids still have the memory of, oh, remember the Easter? We, we uh, watched YouTube and then played kickball. Yeah. And it was just, it, that was one of the things where it's like, there's little glimpses of beauty and God doing little things. We otherwise wouldn't have been doing that. Yeah. We wouldn't have been interacting with those neighbor kids like that. And that's exactly our point, right? Is out of the bad, God can bring some good. Yeah. You know, and I would say this as we went back to just to summarize real quickly on this this question here. You know, when we can see the root of bad and brokenness as sin, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's a simple answer, but a very deep and profound answer. Some like, oh, I don't like that short answer, sin. Well, Sin is profoundly uh, powerful and at work in this world in more ways than we can even see. Yeah. So yeah. it is a complex disease, if you will. Right? Yeah, good, good word there. Yeah, Definitely so we disease. wouldn't be in a counseling session, yeah. right? If husband and wife come in to me and they're like, I can't believe this jerk cheated on me. What do you have to say, Pastor? Ah, sin. That's what happened. Which that, that you guys need to talk anymore, you know? Like, <laughs> so so this answer we're providing here, I'm just trying to get at. It's right. not like how you talk through something, right? I mean, right. There, there's things that the husband and wife could have maybe changed and both worked on to not get to where they are, and they've got some work to do in the future, that sort of stuff. But but the factual matter is stuff. Why does this stuff like happen? Because of sin. Which it's hard because sin. Like, give me a handful of sin. Like, mm -hmm. like you can see the effects of sin, you can see the the outputs of sin, but sin feels intangible. And we as human beings, I want to I want to target something. I want to say that's the fault. Yeah. And so when sure. it's like sin, it feels a little uh, abstract. Right. So I think that may be an area where we struggle because I think back to the, the husband and wife thing. If you were just to say sin, that's truth, but then the husband or wife wants to say no him, and he mm -hmm. would say no her, and they want to get that. Right, and, and that's why, right, is some of the best things in counseling is when you, you move the couple to confession and absolution. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you can do it individually or privately as a couple, and they profess and confess out loud their sins before their spouse, and you in your pastoral role proclaim Christ's word of forgiveness to them. Yeah. Know? So, uh, yeah. And, and you don't get real far trying to pin something on somebody. You know, so I think. Yeah, and, and when we're acting as Christian to Christian, disciple to disciple, and we're helping people that are struggling with something like this, like they're in the middle of a hardship, we have to be really delicate about how we interact with them when they, when they are angry at God. Because it's easy to get angry at God and say, God did this to me. God had my, my husband leave me. God gave me this cancer. And so and, and trying this person, to walk them yeah. away from that, where it's not... God's not hammering you with this. This isn't God's law hammer. This is just the consequence of sin. Right. Yeah. Totally. And and I think and God's not punishing you either. No, and I think I, and I don't know if this person would need to hear this, but just because God redeems a bad or broken or terrible moment in this world doesn't mean he willed the bad to happen. Right. Right. So uh we do have some while limited, some little piece of free will still in our lives. The devil's still at work in our lives. Our own sinful nature still at work in our lives. All of God's and Christ's gifts are still at work in our lives for the good. All these things are happening and going on in our life. And so it's important to know that 
Just because God in his foreknowledge knew that that evil would happen did not mean God ordained the evil right. to happen so that you might learn this. And God's not also um, vindictive sitting up there going, watch this. Right, and right. I'm going to zing Tim here and then watch him squirm. Which is what all of Job's friends thought. Right. Just right. confess your sin and God will let up. And right. so that's why I think we need to we need to be careful with this question in terms of uh, uh, bad things and and. and how we talk about the, the source and origin of those things, and, and we don't associate those things with God. Right. But God can 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 bring about the good. Uh, right. But it doesn't mean he aimed for the bad to happen. Uh, now, might it have been helpful to learn the lesson so you want to kind of attribute it in the end to God? Well, yeah, but you could have probably learned that lesson a lot of other ways too. Sure. You know. Sure. So, so good question. Yeah. So we are... That's probably good for this session. Yeah, it right? probably is. We that were hoping a, to maybe get through three, but we tend to get long winded. We're learning yeah. that we're more long winded on these things, <laughs> which we enjoy it. But hopefully, you enjoy it as well. So, um, and, the, and the hope is, I'll add to this: is long winded is maybe thirty minutes, thirty five. But you know what? That is a perfect time to take a walk, put it on your phone, on the podcast, or headphones, and you'll have it done, and you'll get some exercise, and you'll please your doctor. Absolutely, win, win, win. Right. So going forward, send us more questions. Uh, this, this particular podcast that you ask, we answer, it lives off of the dialogue between us and, and you, the congregation. So uh, email your questions directly to me. Um, as I mentioned in previous messages, um, and as we did today, the questions are general. So we're not going to, if you submit a question that you may think is a little silly or something, we're not going to call you out. We're not going to list your name on here. We'll just talk about the question um, and enjoy the dialogue that we have here. So send those emails in to me, and uh, we'll see you the next time we connect for uh, You Ask, We Answer. Thanks for joining us.